Okay, <clears throat> now we're reading chapter 24 of Game Club. There's just been a drowning. And now we see vivid recollections of Junko-chan. From his mind as it takes its last scoops of consciousness, as it flickers out, the lungs having been filled with water, the heart having stopped, The duck is gone, taken by the current downstream. Underwater. I really like the title, Underwater. It feels very video gamey, you know? It's like, this is just the level that we're on. This is just the stage of game club that we're playing, the underwater level. You know, with this tragedy, it really doesn't feel like they're going to finish their game. It'd be kind of uh, strange if they still bothered making that, um, given that one of the co-creators is dead. Um, but that's too bad. I really wanted to see how the game turned out. I especially wanted to see Bashiko Chan's Island. Talking about explain it to me. How if I was Suikun threw his rubber duck into the river? He jumped into the water after it. He never came back up. Been looking for him, but he's nowhere to be found. I killed him. How do you know he's dead? Wait, ooh, maybe he's not dead. Maybe he's not dead. Because they've been looking for him and they haven't found him. I think it would be even like, oh my god, if they actually killed off Suikun, that would be insane. But it's like that level of tragedy is. Like it's which is it's like too debilitating almost because with the level of character realism they're conveying it's like like how can you see Bashiko Chan reacting to Suikun dying it just it wouldn't it just wouldn't make sense like I think I think that's like almost impossible such that the series can't really progress in an interesting way that really brings out the strength of the character writing if they they make it such that all of the characters are just grieving, I guess is what I'm saying. You know, you know they got to let them be themselves. Plus, if Suikun lives, but he doesn't have Junko-chan, if the duck is still gone, that will be quite a sight to see. Don't know for sure yet. Don't jump to conclusions. It's been three hours. I might have made it out of the river and went home. If he isn't home, then he might be crying alone at some park or something. <laughs> yeah. Prez, like, I think understands Suikun quite well. Oh, Prez's love for the weirdos. I think that's really what made me connect to her so much. She says I love weird people. Police asked me that too, but I don't know his home phone number, so I can't confirm. Don't know either, so I'll ask Sensei right away. <sighs> it's terrible. Yeah. All right, there's a contact number we can use for emergencies. I'll ask his homework teacher right away. Thank you for telling me you've done what you could. Don't worry, you can leave the rest to us. See, this is just a, like, for all of Preza's mysteriousness, I think this is something the series is really good at. All of the characters are kind of mysterious as to why they behave the way they behave, but they're not, like, duplicitous. It's not like they have a secret personality or something. They just have a lot of shit going on in their lives that maybe they don't volunteer that isn't proactively explained to you. Like, Suikun, in the end, admitting that he hated people, that he loves only objects. That was something that was, like, kind of vaguely evident in his character the whole time. It was kind of a twist. It was kind of this moment of revelation. But it wasn't like it undermined the way he behaved before that. Similarly with Prez, we don't really know what's up with her. What's with this killing machine business? What's with this holding a knife with the intent to stab it? My theory is that she had an abusive father because she talks about how her parents hated the fact that she played games. They threw out her favorite game. They thought it was bad for her development. But now she's just living with her mom and her mom evidently doesn't care that she plays games. Right? So that's the father. Anyways, that's beside the point. In these sorts of moments, we can see that it's not like she's going like, 
I don't care. Secretly, I was a sociopath. Nothing like that. She's genuinely worried. She genuinely is freaking out, just like I would, just like anyone would. She just also has this other thing happening. See, it's just obvious, I guess. Of course, there are proper procedures in place for a situation like this. I've done everything I could. I can do now is pray. The, the idea that Prez is like secretly gloomy, you know? It's like she's secretly gloomy, but not inhumanly gloomy. That when she tries to put on a brave face and just do good things and make her game club, make her games, bring people together, that's all real. That's all sincere. But there are sides that she doesn't show people. But she sincerely prays. She sincerely tries her best to help in this situation. You know, it's not a binary thing. I can relate to that. I can relate to that. I can, I've, I've gone through a lot of my life, like, quite depressed. Uh, a lot of my teens and early adulthood and, and aspects of my childhood were pretty bleak. I was pretty depressed. Um, and I would put on, I would try to behave happy. I would try to get along with people and, you know, read the room and, like, interact with people well. Not... But again, like not really being dishonest necessarily, but just being deliberate about how I behave around people such that it's better for everyone. That's how I felt, like that it would be better for everyone if we just kind of got along and had a good time. Um, but I was, you know, I was like secretly gloomy that I was actually quite miserable about my position in life. And by the way, I'm feeling a lot better now. <laughs> um, you know, this social distancing stuff aside, I'm, I'm much less depressed than I've been in my entire adult life because of lots and lots of different things. Um, anyways, um, I lost my train of thought. So yeah, in those times that I was having fun with friends and being happy, I, it wasn't that I was being duplicitous. It wasn't that I was faking happiness. I was genuinely happy. I just gave an impression, I deliberately gave an impression that there was a level of happiness that was normal to me, that was like foundational to my life, when instead it was actually kind of like the exception. I think that's kind of how Prez behaves. I should tell my Shida Chen to calm her down. You know, I've contacted the teachers, she'll be able to do something about this. Dude, what, I killed him? I don't know just yet. I will know eventually. Depending on the result, I'm responsible too. If anything happens to you, I'll die too. What a strange choice of words. Because there's no way Morishida Chan would be given the death penalty for throwing a duck over the bridge. Uh, <laughs> no way in hell. Um, and even if she's like socially blamed and stuff, she's the type of forthright, honest person to not let that, like, her social standing doesn't actually change all that much, even if it gets out that this happened and people blame her. So I think Prez here, she's like, depending on the result, maybe I could be charged with something. Maybe I could be charged with some sort of aggressive behavior to him. And I think that's how Prez infers her meaning as well, that she could actually be in some sort of legal trouble. I'm not actually sure. I don't know. Um, and she's saying, she takes that, but like runs with it to the nth degree. I'll die too. It's my job done. Oh man, oh Prez. Silicon can't be dead. Don't know for sure yet. Don't know if he's dead or not just yet. I'll worry about it when we're actually sure. Schrodinger Sula. Oh, no, that's not funny. I'll worry about it when it turns out he actually is dead. I'll worry about it then. I'll worry about it if he's dead. I'll worry about it if he's dead, if he's dead, if he's dead. This is intensely relatable. And I don't think this time it's like, wow, me and the Prez. 
she's my avatar into this world. More that I think everyone does this, right? I think this just highlights a subtle universal truth that is late night worrying. It's lying in bed, being unable to sleep, the sort of thought process you have. And this is one that I, I, whew, I think even just now I've realized how powerful it is, how negatively powerful it is, that is. When you try to reassure yourself with these kind of conditional statements of saying, okay, well, I'm not going to worry about this yet because this condition hasn't been fulfilled. Um, and this is, this is actually super relevant right now. Like I'm, I'm constantly thinking, as I'm sure lots of people are, about the COVID situation, about how long social distancing and social isolation will last, what my life will be like 100 days from now. Will I be able to maintain my sanity? What will I do to support myself? And a lot of times you get into a position where you're thinking, all right, well, I, I guess I'll just have to see because I don't know this condition. I don't know if this is going to go this way or that way. I don't know how effective this or that will be. So I'll only worry about it if this happens, right? That's, that's kind of a common attempt at an endpoint to these cycles of worry. But in establishing the possibility of that being the case, you've actually planted the seed much deeper than if you just kind of tried to dismiss it as like, oh, I'm sure that won't be the case. Do you know what I'm saying? That in, in trying to give yourself some comfort by saying it might not be like that, your brain will just focus in on the, oh, so you're telling me there's a chance that it's like that. I think this is an extremely common thought pattern. Maybe I'm stating the obvious here, but I, I don't think I've ever felt it so obvious and articulate, uh, articulated to me. It's just something that my mind has been doing this whole time. <laughs> uh, yeah, what if he actually is? Exactly, exactly. If he's dead, it's all over. He'll disappear from the school. When you shoot a channel, fall into just despair. Our game will never be finished. It'll be as if the sun has vanished from the club. If he's dead. If he's dead. Even she can't picture Bishiko-chan. Bishiko-chan is not plausible in this scenario. She also ceases to exist. It's over. If he's dead, it's all over. I can't, I can't stop thinking about it. It's someone help yet. Nope, this is how it is. Ooh, I have to tell them too. And this is interesting because like, maybe rationally she's thinking this is a good thing to do to let the other members of the club know what's happening. You could, that, that's like definitely possible. But I think more what it is, is this is an impulse I've had at these states too, where if I, I just can't sleep and I'm getting super claustrophobic in my own thoughts you want to talk to somebody and I think it's actually really good to talk to somebody and it's a good instinct to have to reach out to someone you trust someone who might be able to help you I feel lucky I have a friend who lives in Norway so around like 3 a.m 4 a.m he's waking up he's like up and active and and wants and is ready to talk so the situations where I overlap into his morning because I'm in some terrible wreck state of despair and anxiousness, he's a really good friend to, uh, to reach out to. And I'm, I'm going to tell him that. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm happy to think of this and to tell him that. And hopefully he won't mind that I'm talking about our friendship in a video like this. But yeah, and that's been my instinct. That's been the support I reach out to. I'll be like, I can't sleep, can't stop thinking about blank. And he'll usually be like, I'm really sorry to hear that. I hope you realize that, you know, blank isn't probably anywhere near as bad as you think it is. You're just extremely underslept and worked up. Why don't you just kind of focus on this aspect? Why don't you just think about this instead? Tomorrow you can do this and that. Tomorrow you can figure out this and that. It's really reassuring. A very good friend. I hope that I can be a comfort to him as well. Chantal Oyone. To rely upon. What about Bishiko? Exactly. I don't want to tell her. I don't want to. Exactly. Exactly. She understands. She understands exactly what I was worried about too. That she would just. How could she be after this? 
don't want to ruin her cheerfulness. So I don't have to tell her that I won't. I'll stay like this until tomorrow. Not thinking about anything, just sitting still. Huh. It's only 9 o'clock. I would have thought it was like 2 a.m. or something. But I guess she was just in the middle of gaming when uh, she was given the call. And yeah, they were just coming home from the movie. So there's no way that much time has progressed. I guess the ambiguous spot is like, how long is she lying here like this? But yeah, she actually tried to go to the bed like hella early. It's really dark outside now. Why should a Chan should have gone home already, right? What if she can't go to sleep too? What's Silicon doing right now? Where is he? Why would he do something like jumping into a river? This is very interesting paneling. It's not like the thought bubbles are split in some meaningful way. It's just... What strange, seemingly unnecessary paneling. It also seems to reflect this like window that she's looking out of and seeing the darkness. Like the windows they looked out of and saw the mad moon. The mad moon is watching us! Oh, those are such good chapters. Up until this point, I had been really impressed with the series, of course. But then when I started reading... Is it these ones? No, this is when they go to the... Yeah, this is just about the game. It's these ones. Where they're playing it. Where Suakun keeps freaking out about things. Where he sees... <laughs> oh, I think this is so well done. Because I, I really could relate to Suikun. I That sort of thing would really freak me out as a kid, too. What am I doing? Is this what I should do? It's my fault. Oh, Prez. I can't stand this. Yeah, I can feel this one, too. I feel it both ways. Sometimes you toss and turn for what feels like hours, and it's been 10 minutes. Other times you toss and turn and it feels like an hour and it's actually been five hours. <laughs> Those ones are actually scarier because it's like, oh my god, I'm like really not going to sleep tonight. Um, but at the same time, it's like, oh, well, at least it didn't feel as bad as it actually was. And I suspect during those times I'm actually like micro sleeping. I'm just kind of drifting in and out of sleepiness. And that's why time is passing so quickly. And usually that's where we're having like really weird abstract thoughts that are still, of course, like, anxious and, and nightmarish. I need a change of mood. It's my fault. This is where she ends up. I found this with, like, these sort of thought processes, too. Eventually, you get to the point where you start making, like, really definitive statements. It's my fault. It must be. It's just my fault. Um, right? Like, because you're just trying to end it. You're trying to get the sum end. And maybe you don't even know, like, that you, you don't even believe what you're saying, or you don't even know if it's true, but you've decided, like, maybe I'll stop thinking about it if I just decide it's my fault. It's fun days at the game club won't ever return. <laughs> fun days. I mean, they were fun days, like playing games with the Mishiko Chan and there were so many fun days, but I, I always felt like something like this was going to happen. Don't want to see that tough Morishiro Chan be depressed. Oh, I guess she does use Morishiro Chan. I guess that's why I used it once. Such a sincere girl, and now she might end up killing us. Oh my god. This is where you end up, though. You start thinking the most extreme version of things. Just because you're trying to cut the cycle short. Oh, I mean, this is true. This is like a legit psychological phenomenon. Because the brain has so many crazy feedback loops between what the body is doing and what the brain is telling itself about what's happening, by forcing yourself to laugh or smile, you can actually brighten your mood. It's like some kind of crazy Pavlovian reverse psychology thing. Reverse psychology. <laughs> That's a different thing. Uh, time inverse psychology? I don't know. Simulate my parasympathetic nervous system by forcing a smile. Yeah, that's what it's called. The parasympathetic nervous system. Relax. Play some games. 
how clueless I was. I was playing some stupid game up until then. I had no idea what was going on. Oh, I hate that feeling. I can always remember what I was doing when I got really bad news, and it always just seems so stupid. It just seems like, like what did I, did I really think this was what was important? Yeah, even with all this like COVID social distancing stuff, it turned out quite nicely. I actually did do a lot of really fun things right before, like it became quite dire and the need to stay home was very evident to me because a friend of mine is visiting from Japan. It's really sad. She can't go back to Japan. Uh, the job she was about to start has been delayed indefinitely. And uh, her plan was to come and hang out a bit while she was between jobs and see everybody and see her family. But now it's like she can see her parents because she's stuck in quarantine with her parents. And she's very, very paranoid. Not unduly paranoid, but the proper amount of say that she really, really doesn't want to get her parents infected because they're, they're quite old. So she's doing the right thing, but it sucks that she's here. I barely ever get to see her, and she's here in Canada, and we can't see each other. But at least she was here for a couple weeks before then. And during that time, because she was here, we did a whole bunch of stuff with a whole bunch of our friends. We went out and shopped and had a lot of fun. So that was good. So I had some very good memories right up to the final point. And then even though it made the, the contrast like all the more severe, I'm still really glad I did it. But it is there is this kind of silliness that I look back at. Like we went to like square one, this like gigantic, super crowded shopping mall, like the week before um, I started like social isolating. It's just like, oh my god, like, what were we doing? <laughs> like, maybe that was even a bad idea at the time. I don't think so. I think at the time it was fine, because there was only, like, two cases in Toronto. Anyways, I don't mean to talk about this. I don't re I, I talk about this with, like, all my friends all day, every day. So, like, why am I still talking about it? This is amazing. The slow progression of time. It's fun. I've had nights like this before. Me too. It's been a while. I forgot since every day has been so fun lately. Sleepless nights like this were nothing unusual for me. Yep, I understand. Cursing my parents, cursing school. Day after day, I, I wish that the world would just end. Every evening, every night, I would wallow in sadness. How did I survive? I forgot. How did I manage to survive that? I don't remember either. I really don't remember either. Of course, I'm sure my nature, the, the nature of my depression and my sadness was very different than hers. But I had a lot of sleepless nights. Games. It was games. I had games. Some stupid game? What am I even saying? During my darkest hour, games are what saved me. That's actually pretty true for me, too. <laughs> I can remember playing a lot of Final Fantasy Tactics Advance during some of the really terrible years of my teens. Yeah, that helped me a lot. Games were the only things that saved this bullied child from death, I see. I see. Not the teachers, not the parents. Games were what gave me hope. I remember now. I survived because I had games. I looked forward to the sequels. Got as much enjoyment out of them as possible. And to the older games, too. Is this the game she wanted to play? There's a chapter where she ends up playing like a Grand Theft Auto type game with uh, Bishiko chan. Is this the game she wanted to play? Where she's just like, I'm going to take a nice relaxing drive. Strength, I need it now. She was playing all these different games. Dr. Mario. Or is that more like Poyo? No, this is definitely more Poyo. Because Dr. Mario would have pieces floating somewhere. Yeah, this is Poyo. But it looks like the Dr. Mario pill bottle. That's what I thought it was Dr. Mario. 
confusing. I don't know what game this is. No idea. Can't focus. <gasps> oh my god! This is something I've talked to a few of my friends about. Recently a friend of mine sold his Switch. I was like, why'd you sell your Switch? He was like, oh, uh, you know. End up wasting too much time. He played a lot of Smash Ultimate. He would play Netplay on Smash Ultimate, which just sounds miserable. Like everyone complains about it. I don't know why he did it. He had a million other things to do. <laughs> but you know, that bothered him too. It's like I just play Smash Ultimate and it's not very fun. And then he bought Fire Emblem. And he was like pretty excited to play it. Because you know, it's getting great reviews. And he'd seen a lot of fan art for it, and he wanted to draw his own fan art for it. So he's a very popular artist. Um, so he was like, all right, I'm going to play Fire Emblem. And he played it for like a week. And then he was like, this isn't fun. I'm just not having fun. So he sold his Switch. He still plays rhythm games. It's part of our rhythm gaming club. So I was like, what about 2DX? It's like, it's not really fun. <laughs> it's like, I just do it because it's, you know, it's something to get good at. It's more about the the mental exercise. It's more about the the challenge and the feeling of accomplishment. But he's like, it's a waste of time. Like, I could have been doing something else. It's not like it's really that fun. And I remember really being kind of crushed by this. Like, I felt a little sad for him. I said just two contradictory things. You can't be crushed and then also be a little sad. But it was something, it was a weird feeling I had, that's for sure. And I felt myself like the games used to be more fun. That maybe I had felt this feeling sneaking up on me and I was in denial. And then I played Animal Crossing and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> what am I talking about? Games are so fun. <laughs> no, I don't know. I've heard this from a few people now. The, the games are becoming evidently less fun than they were in their childhood. And that maybe for a while it was like the fact that there were so many new games coming out and that your capability of buying the games you want, that sense of agency you had that you gained more as an adult, and the thrill of the explosive technological advancements of games into our modern era offset this creeping feeling that maybe games were becoming less fun, less engrossing, less all-consuming, which only makes sense because when you're a kid, you don't really have that many experiences and playing through a great game can easily eclipse so many other significant, like it, it holds such a place of significance just because you haven't really done that much else. Like the percentage of time as a child that I spent playing Super Mario RPG was huge because I just didn't have that much time alive. But now you play a game and it constitutes such a tiny sliver of percentage of the things you've done. How can it be that engrossing? How can it be that meaningful? You have so much other stuff going on. Oh my god. But no, that's not true. No, no. What am I talking about? St things still definitely affect me, like, a lot. Like, right now I'm reading this manga. How many hundreds of manga have I read? How many thousands of volumes have I read? And yet this one still is... feels like it's drilling to the deepest, most sensitive parts of my heart. I have nothing to worry about. I'll always care. But that's just me. I hope my friend cares. Yes, of course he does. He loves Isokan. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Isokan.
bullied, abusive father, father and mother fighting, living in poverty, maybe just with her. Oh man, this isn't the situation I had at all, by the way. I was bullied, but not like this. I still, I also had friends. I was bullied, but I had friends. I was in that position. Which is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, lot better than being bullied and not having friends. And my parents divorced, but it was never really that nasty. And I never lived in poverty. Both my parents were pretty successful. They had professional careers they could provide for me. But I have a friend who this is extremely close to her situation. I was actually just talking to her today about it. This friend I find, even though our lives have been very, very different, we've like arrived at a lot of like kind of similar feelings and stuff. Like more, more that I can remember having a lot of feelings that she has now. So I feel quite fondly of her. Like I feel like I really want to help her. I really want to share whatever has helped me this far with her. So this is the origin of the killing machine. It's like a Tomb Raider-esque game maybe. Dark Souls. Maybe these are movies too. And this of course is whatever it's called, Night of whatever, it has the Mad Moon, the one that made such an impact on her. Still alive because you told me that you'd always be by my side. Now this has a really interesting interactions with the whole discussion of objects of these kind of pure manifestations of someone's will towards the universe that outlives everyone that ought to be safe and protected. Games are like kind of this weird midpoint between alive and dead, which is why the digital organisms were so interesting to Suakun as well. But I don't feel like having this kind of existential conversation about the nature of consciousness and brains and, and objects and what it means to be eternal and stuff. I mean, you can tell that I... I actually do, because <laughs> it's also interesting, but it's not happening. I can't rely on you when it's truly hard, then what should I do? That was a big time leap. I guess she gamed for quite a while, futilely. It's over, it's all over. Oh, God. <gasps> he's alive or he's dead? Is this his corpse? Or is he alive? I don't think it's his corpse. I don't think this is the type of series to show the corpse. He's alive. He's alive. I'm so relieved. Oh my god, I'm so relieved. It started becoming apparent to me that for all I said about, you know, you can't make Bushiko-chan sad, you can't quash the charm of the series by making everyone just grieve for the last two volumes, but I was like, no, they could. <laughs> they totally could. And it would be so sad. So I'm relieved that that isn't the ending we're getting. Kill me. Don't want to live anymore. Kill me.
Jesus. Oh, man. I'm glad I waited a while to read these. I had a chance that I could have read them in new videos when they first came out, but I was I was kind of emotionally unstable that day anyways. And part of me was like, oh, I bet it's going to be really crazy. I, I want to dive into it and really let it, you know, just like shatter my world or some blah. What was I thinking? This, this is, I couldn't have handled it for sure. Today I actually had a really good day, so I'm, uh, I'm keeping it together, but this is rough. I'm starting to care less and less about it. Yeah, I don't care anymore. I don't give a damn. Nothing to do with it. It's not my fault. Hello, Firefly. This is so relatable. This must be a universal experience, right? These kind of stages of these all-night worrying sessions. The trying to think definitive thoughts answer. And then later, the like, I don't care anymore answer. And that that is actually the, the final stage that I find. Is that somehow my body is just finally exhausted of it. And it feels less significant. And it feels like the apathy finally overpowers everything. And you just fall asleep. Finally, finally, finally. You just find yourself asleep. It's crazy. Just a, f a couple hours later, 6 a.m. Oh, it's her alarm. I thought she was getting a call that they're like, he's alive. But no, it's just when her alarm goes off. Does she have school today? Is this a school night? I think it was. Was it? I don't know. I think I think they went to go see the movie on a Sunday, so this is probably Monday. It's probably back to school. Mad Moon. Always been my idol. It sucks that we never find out what this actually means. Because they give up on playing the game. It's too hard for them. So it's so funny, like we saw part of it. We saw part of it in quite some detail and depth, but we didn't see anywhere near enough to kind of extrapolate what the rest of the game is going to be like, or what something like this actually represents. It's so haunting, you know, because we saw the part we saw in such detail. And now we'll just never know. Why is this thing her idol? Like, what is going on? These are like bubbles, like the whole town is underwater. There he is. They find him at last. I guess they had to wait until the morning, really, to see him, because it would have been like pitch black way out here in the country. I'm not worthy of you. Is he saying that maybe because he lived? And he feels like, like selfishly lived. That he ought to have died instead. Ohio, Ohio. I guess she didn't end up contacting any of the other club members, right? Because she she pictured telling Bishiko Chan and then gave up on the whole thing. Dinner reports. Oh, what the heck? Like we knew that she was getting bullied. I didn't know it was this kind of thing. I didn't know she was an honor student either. Very, very close to my own experiences. I wasn't really bullied into doing people's work, but I would very eagerly do people's work in order for them to like me. Because, you know, I was, I was a genius. I was a resident genius of our public school. Sufi's in for the hospital. They found him. He's 
heart, but he's alive. Probably worried about him, so I figured you'd want to know that. That's all. <gasps> oh, oh, God. Uh, she was crying with relief, right? I think her smile changes. She looks a little different. And then, of course, she cries. Are we all doing well? Whoa! <laughs> this is a barrier I can't overcome. I can never be physically affectionate with people. But in my heart, this is how I wish I could be. I wish I could just hug people. Sorry. Oh, God. Yeah, this is how I would be if I was actually her. <laughs> Look at her face. Of course she's absent today. She thinks she's killed someone. Get. Yeah. I don't know that they found him. Can I catch a break? I need time to cool off too. <laughs> Yeah. It's kind of like a Kumiko energy that the Prez has, I think. Kumiko is also someone who you would maybe call s secretly gloomy. I really like Kumiko too. Going to her house. Even later. isn't home yet. Whoa. Tell her parents. This is her mother. It's really interesting. Very, very curious about what kind of person her mother is. Because we know, we know now that she kind of inherited her mentality from her grandmother. So we don't really know anything about her relationship with her parents. I say she'd be at the river, though. That's nice. It's nice that she's considerate of her parents to that degree. She's still very rational about this. If my parents think I'm missing, it'll be bad. I'll tell them where they are so uh, they can find me if they're worried or they need me. So now she goes to the river too, the, the scene of the incident. She actually is here. She's honest. She doesn't lie. Yeah, I, I, it would make a lot of sense for her to be there. Yeah. <laughs> empty screen school. Found Sirkin, you can rest now. <gasps> oh my god. I didn't find it, it'd still be lost. For a body, but no one would bother doing the same for a rubber duck. Yeah. I mean, this is something they're going to confront. No way in hell they're finding that duck, right? It would be so contrary to, I think, everything in this series. And, and I feel like there's going to be such a significant uh, event seeing how Suikun recovers or doesn't from this. But yeah, they're not going to find the duck. I'm tired, Kofun. Hacky, hacky. From the side, from the side of where? Whoa! Well, this is crazy. Okay, so they have this the senpai character that showed up once, no, twice, um, and played fighting games. I thought she was such a well-written character. She seemed like such a feasible person. Like. I don't know. I was. I just. She was so well done. I was so like intrigued by her that she she skipped club all the time. She probably joined it because she thought it would be like a fighting game club, <laughs> but instead it's a game development club. All she wants to do is play games. She loves fighting games. The 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 when she battles Prez. Oh, it's so cute. It's so endearing. Prez just spams low kick. Oh. Oh man. Um. Anyways. Um. I lost my train of thought. 
she she doesn't show up like ever again. I thought she would just disappear. I thought she wouldn't show up again. I thought that was like actually so cool to have a character that just shows up like a couple times. But she's actually gonna come in handy. There she is. Rare character. <laughs> Oh, I don't know where it is. <laughs> the fact that Morishido Chan goes along with this is like really shows how defeated she is. Drive me alongside the river. Yeah, yeah, she doesn't even ask for an explanation. <laughs> and I'm sure Morishido Chan didn't tell her anything either. But there's no way this is gonna work. For rubber duck, rubber duck. For road. This is like cute. <laughs> Still riding around on this scooter. It's like, oh, man, I don't know. this series, this series. Whistling. You know, the previous chapters were called pre-apocalypse, right? So the apocalypse, of course, was the throwing of the duck and uh, Suakun's attempted suicide, or not really attempted suicide, attempt to find the duck, and then not really caring whether he lived or died. This one feels like post-apocalyptic. Feels like girls last tour, just scooting around together. Looking for something, looking for nothing. Asking for a miracle here. Ooh, want to try floating the same kind of rubber duck down the river? That's an idea, but no. Rained yesterday too, so the water was higher. It's wide too, it splits too. If we float down the river, we might as well give it to the guy instead. So I guess she explained it a bit to the senpai. The new one's never going to cut it, though. It's definitely not going to trick him. If we could find it, everything would be back to the way it was before. See you, Kina-chan. She doesn't call her friends. That is disrespectful. Sometimes you just got to know when to give up. <laughs> that was a pretty cool line. <laughs> Say that, where are we going to find it? Over here or over here? Um... Well, I got the story. It's still out there. It's still out there somewhere. I wonder if that'll give him any peace to know that Junko Chan probably wasn't destroyed. It's just floating off to the ocean now. Where it will be eventually destroyed by the sun and the salt. Wow. Okay, so that was the entire volume. I should have realized because it was titled Underwater and not like part one or whatever. So that's it, like that's, after this, the the final volume is coming. Oh, that's true. Yeah, true. Yeah, true. Hey. Nice assumption, bruh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is really good. What? Okay, this is like really bizarre. Because <laughs> my friend is Jura Lumen. They're both named after the bear in Yatsuba. <laughs> Dura Lumen and Dura Lumen. <laughs> My friend that I mentioned before that's reading this. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> what? Soon generous someone has informed me that they bought volume 1 to 11 series up the net. is waiting for shipping, so volume 11 will be coming when they've received and scanned it. Might take a while to ship, though, considering you know what. That's me! <laughs> oh my god. Oh my friggin' god. Alright. Alright. 